Welcome to GATA Academy in our session called, So You Are Hired as a GA or TA, Now What? As a heads up, this session is being recorded. My name is Katie Hirsch, and I'm a third year PhD student in the Department of Kinesiology, and I've helped lead a few GATA Academy sessions in the past, including this specific session earlier this week. And my name is Kayla, and I'm going to co-lead this workshop with Katie. And similar to Katie, I'm also a third year PhD student. So we'll first go over some of the basics, including eligibility requirements for being a GA or TA. And we assume that most, if not all of you, have already been appointed to your position. So this should be a refresher for you and a great time to ensure that you are indeed eligible to be a GA or a TA. Then we'll go over steps to starting the semester off strong. Then we'll broadly cover roles and expectations for GAs and TAs, followed by information regarding communicating with both the instructor as well as students in the class, and topics related to grading assignments and using technology as a GA or TA. This will be followed by a catch-all of topics in our other aspects to consider section, then we'll share tips for tackling online concerns if you happen to be a GA or a TA who's working in an online or partially online course this coming semester. And lastly, we'll provide you all with several resources that we believe will be valuable for helping you along the way throughout this semester. At the end, we'll ask you to complete an evaluation for this workshop to give us feedback on the content that we've covered as well as how Kayla and I did sharing the content with you. In terms of format of our workshop, you can ask questions in the chat and we'll be stopping several times throughout the workshop for any questions that you have. So if your question doesn't get answered right away, please be patient with us. To begin, here are some of the general requirements for being a GA or TA. And a key difference between both of them is that GAs are graduate students, whereas TAs are undergraduate students. There are several types of TAs that are dependent on where you are in your undergraduate student career. So TA1s are first or second year students, whereas TA2s are third or fourth year. And TA3s can be a few different things, including people who are GAs but are not appointed for that term, or they may not be a student, or they could be an undergraduate student who is already holding a degree. So when you fill out your contract, and most of you have probably already done this, that's where it will show what level of TA you are or if you are a GA. So it's important to remember throughout your experience as a GA or TA that you are both a student and an employee at that time. So as such, you must be registered as a student that term and be considered in good standing by your program. In regards to employee requirements, you need to obtain your employee number with the university, and that's typically a five digit number that you'll get from human resources or HR. And as an employee, you need to make sure to complete any mandatory employee training. And we'll be sharing a link later on in the workshop as it relates to um, finding out where you can do your mandatory training. And of course, you must be eligible, eligible to work if you're an international student and your study permit should give you guidelines on where and how much you are able to work. If you have any questions about this, we do recommend contacting either a secretary within your department or someone at the International Student Center. This type of situation varies very much from a case to case basis, and that's why we recommend reaching out to them for the best guidance. And then for all students, we want to remind you that within your contract, there is a limit in the total hours that you're able to work. And we'll cover this in more detail later on, but it is also a key component of the general requirements that you have. And these are some more requirements that are specific to GAs. So if you're a GA, you must be registered full time. And if you're not registered, the department cannot approve your contract and therefore you will be unable to work. So please make sure you're registered as a full time student as soon as possible. And also note that you must stay registered full time throughout the entire semester. 
And if the above conditions are met and you are appointed to a position, you're able to fill an appointment position as a GA for the first six terms of your master's program or the first 12 terms if you are a full-time doctoral student. As for TAs, you must be registered before your contract can be approved as well. However, if you're a domestic student, meaning that you're a Canadian student, you can be registered part-time or full-time. On the other hand, international students who are TAs must be registered full-time, as well as having a valid study or a work permit in Canada. And all TAs will need to stay registered throughout the semester as well and be in good standing. And to be in good standing, what that means is essentially that you're not on academic probation. So does anybody have any questions so far on the information that we've covered? So now that we've covered those foundational components, let's talk about what you should do in the next couple days, weeks, and months. So you came to this workshop to answer the question that you see here. I've been offered my GA or TA appointment, now what? So we talked a little bit about this contract that you need to sign earlier on. And we mentioned that uh, this contract um, is required to be signed in order for you to work and you must also be registered. But what is the actual contract itself? It's a document that's put together by your department that's also called the Notice of Appointment to Assistantship. And someone within your department, likely the secretary, will end up sending you your contract. You don't need to go digging for it. Someone should send it to you, likely via email. And it needs to be signed by you as the GA or TA as well as by the department head and the Dean of Graduate Studies. If you'd like to obtain your own copy of the contract that has all of the signatures, once it's been approved by Graduate Studies, you can do so by contacting your department secretary. And when you sign your contract, that's when you'll be assigned your employee number from HR. And as a reminder, this is a five digit number. And you can and should complete any mandatory training that's required of you as a new employee. And also note that your department may have specific deadlines for when you should be completing the mandatory training. So this would vary by department. And now I'm gonna drop a link in the chat um, regarding mandatory training. And you can visit that after the workshop is completed if you'd like any more information. So once you've filled out that contract, you'll need to then contact your instructor for the course. You'll be working with them closely throughout the term, and so building that relationship early on will be really helpful for both you and the instructor. So just simply introduce yourself. If you know who your instructor is right now, we'd recommend contacting them by the end of the day. They may not have a lot that they wanna share with you right now before your semester gets started, or maybe they will, but at least they know who you are and that you're going to be their GA or TA for the semester. It's important to note that once you find out the course that you have, as well as your instructor, to not make any assumptions about what your roles and responsibilities will be. Any two GAs or TAs can have very different roles and responsibilities, as well as the instructor may take a different approach to teaching that course from, they, from how they did in the past. And that would also then require you as a GA or TA to have different responsibilities. So these are just a couple of many different reasons why your roles and responsibilities may not be what you assume. Therefore, you should ask a lot of questions. Ask until you feel comfortable and confident to take on this semester. And in a few moments, we'll cover lots of different topics, as well as providing you with potential questions that you can ask that will give you a really strong understanding of what your semester will look like as a GA or a TA.
So once you've contacted the instructor and gotten all of your questions answered, you'll then need to fill out a document called Form 1. And your Form 1 is co-created by you and the instructor. It details what your duties will be, as well as how many hours are expected to be used for each duty or responsibility. And while you're filling out this form, this is another great time to ask any additional questions that you have or seek any clarity regarding your duties. You can also go over any scheduling concerns that you have and whether you think it will take longer to complete a certain assignment or whether you'll be absent during a specific time in this semester. These would be important things to address early on with the instructor so that they can adjust if need be. And lastly, although this form is originally filled out in the beginning of the term, you and the instructor will have an opportunity to review it midway through the semester. And at this time, you can record any changes that you and the instructor see fit. And here is a blank copy of what a Form 1 will look like. It's possible that you and your instructor will fill it out together or that the instructor will end up filling it out by themselves and then send it to you for any feedback or concerns that you have. So in terms of what the form actually looks like and what's on it, at the top, you'll see that it asks, asks for information regarding your student name and number as well as other details about the course. Then in the middle, there's a section on all of your duties. On the left-hand side is where it will detail what the specific duty will be. So maybe that's getting trained or prepared or specific tasks related to marking. And they, the instructor may also decide to add in additional tasks that are not already there, and that would be in the other duties section. Then on the right of that middle section, you'll see columns related to the hours. And so at the start of this semester, you guys will fill out the initial column, and that will be how many hours are expected to do each of the tasks. And then at the midway point, you can revise that in the column next to it. Then at the bottom, you, the instructor, and then the chair or the head of your department will have to sign it. And typically, you will just be expected to sign it and then send it back to your instructor or back to the department um, secretary. You do not need to, you will typically not need to gather everyone's signatures yourself. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat. Feel free to ask at any time if you need any clarity on what we're talking about or have any questions that expand on what we're talking about. So you may be wondering, how many hours am I allowed to work? This will be explained in your contract. For example, you may be a GA who works 70 hours for the whole semester. This would be detailed in your contract that you are allowed to work no more than 70 hours for that term. It may also detail it in, a, in, the, break, in the broken down form of how many hours you're allowed to work per week. So for example, if you're allowed to work 70 hours in a semester, that will break down to five hours per week as what it would break down for an average, not that you have to work exactly that many hours each week. And it's important to note that your instructor cannot authorize you to work beyond your limit. Even if there are more assignments that need to be marked, if you are out of your hours, then you are not permitted to work more. If you think that you're going to go above your hours that are outlined in your contract, then you must notify the instructor. And you need to do that in writing. So email them so that there is a record of it. And you should be sure to send that email and notify them at least 20 hours before the completion of your hours. So with that same example of a 70 hour student, you would then need to notify them before 50 hours are completed. And if you tell them early on that you may be going above your hours, you can also discuss that at the midway semester review of your Form 1. Okay. 
So what are the specific limits on hours per term? So for a TA, um, there is no limit on the minimum. TA ones and twos can work up to 100 hours per semester, and TA threes can work up to 110 hours per semester. And if you happen to be a TA for multiple courses or different courses from different departments at the same time, your hours cannot combine to be more than 100 hours in a given semester. Now on to GAs. GA hours will typically range from 70 to 140 per term. As a graduate student, your GA appointment hours count towards the total limit that you're allowed to work as an employee of the university. And so that total that you're allowed to work as an employee is 240 hours of paid employment per semester. And this would include things like being a GA or if you're a research assistant who is paid, as well as being a sessional instructor. And if you are a sessional instructor, you cannot be a GA at the same time as when you're teaching. So again, you cannot hold a sessional appointment and a GA appointment in the same term. If you've accepted a sessional appointment, you need to let the secretary know that you will not need the GA appointment, that you will not be accepting it. And now that we've covered uh, what your hours may look like per term, let's go over the limits on the number of terms you are allowed to work. So TAs, again, you have no limits. You can apply to work every single term. Of course, you're not gonna be guaranteed to get a TA appointment, but you can always apply. GAs have it a bit different. The university will have a funding commitment to graduate students such that master's students cannot work more than three full terms, totaling at 140 hours per term. And that means you cannot work as a GA for over 420 hours total. You may work a couple of terms, for example, at 70 hours, and then a couple for 140 to add up to the total of 420. So as an example, an HK, a master's student will typically work 70 hours per semester in their first year. So two different semesters at 70 hours each. And then in their second year, they will work 140 hours per semester. And that gives them the total of 420. Then for PhD students, you cannot work more than 70 terms at 140 hours. And that leaves PhD students limited to about 930 hours in total. And in some cases, GAs may be eligible to apply for an additional term, and you should discuss this with your department secretary if you're in a situation like this, or you anticipate that you will be in a situation like that. So now we're just gonna reiterate a few things we've already discussed so that you guys don't forget. If you are a GA or a TA, you need to be registered as a student throughout this semester. This will break your contract if you do not remain registered. And of course, you must stay in good standing throughout this semester and perform your duties as a GA or a TA in a manner that's deemed satisfactory. And that will be up to the instructor to determine how well you are performing your duties. Then for GA specifically, you must apply to work each term before the GA application deadline. You will do that until you have three full terms of support if you're a master's student and seven full terms of support if you are a PhD student. We'll take another pause to see if we have any questions. You guys are a quiet bunch. It's likely that if you're unsure about something that someone else in the workshop may be as well. So please don't hesitate to ask any questions. All right. 
So now you may be wondering, what if I can't work during one of the terms that I'm eligible? Well, if you're a GA, you can request to have an assistantship exemption. And there are a few guidelines to this. So first, you must submit your request in writing before the first day of the semester. And master's students are going to be granted one exemption or can be granted one exemption. And PhD students can be granted up to three terms of exemption. And if you are a PhD student who takes an appointment as a sessional instructor, you will have two terms that you can request and be exempted or be granted an exemption. And the department will also be able to offer that GA appointment later on, as long as you are still eligible as a student. So it may work similar to a deferral where you take a semester off with the intention of working as a GA later on. And as a reminder, you can only then work later on if you meet the conditions and requirements that we went over earlier. And lastly, on this slide at the bottom, you'll see a list of reasons that a GA may decline their appointment without penalty. And these reasons include things like a leave of absence that's approved by the department or by graduate studies, and these would be things like parental leave, maternity or paternity leave, a medical leave, bereavement, and other personal emergencies. Or you may be taking a co-op term or acting as a sessional instructor. So we'll take another pause for any questions. So now we'll go over what you should do if you want to work less hours than what your appointment um, says in your contract. And you can request this if you want to work less hours. Make the request to your chair or department secretary because the department must approve you working less hours than what is originally expected. It's also important to note that if the department does agree to offer fewer hours, that it will still count as a term of support based on the original offer hours that you were offered. So to give you an example, if you had 140 hours in your appointment and you requested to then work 100 hours instead, if the department approves your request to work 100 hours, that will still count as a semester of 140. So you can't really pick and choose when you'd like to work hours and then use them as rollover time later on. And this is for GAs. So now we'll sort of switch gears. That was a lot of information related to the department and forms and things like that. And now we'll move on to what your day to day may look like as a GA or TA. I do see a question in the chat. Paige, I may need you to clarify this, but I believe if you work 100 hours, you will get paid on a structure related to 100 hours, not being, you won't get paid for 140. Yep, that's correct. Great, thank you. All right, so moving on to roles and expectations. Remember how we discussed the form one earlier and how you should ask a lot of questions before the semester starts? This is where we'll be sharing lots of great useful questions that you can ask. And we'll begin with broader questions that relate to your roles and expectations. And you can start by simply asking what responsibilities will I have? For instance, you might be a GA or TA who only marks assignments or attends office hours, or you may do a combination of both of those things. You can also ask whether you are expected to attend the weekly classes. And if you are, these, uh, your time in that class will count towards your hours on your contract. For example, if you attend both lectures that are about an hour and a half, that would count towards roughly three hours of your appointment. 
And if you are expected to attend those, you may also then want to follow up and ask what your responsibilities will be during those lectures. For instance, should you be monitoring the chat or just simply observing so that you can learn or relearn the material yourself? And you may also be responsible for running some of the sessions with students, such as providing a lecture or running labs or discussions. And it can be helpful for you to know this as to whether you'll be doing that or not at the start of the semester so that you can plan accordingly and be sure to have those dates marked in your calendar. And you can also ask about your responsibilities on Blackboard. And so you may be responsible for posting content or announcements or the instructor may decide to do that themselves. That can really vary by class and by instructor. And additionally, you can ask about what you should do if you're unable to fulfill your duties for reasons such as um, an illness or an emergency. And the instructor may respond by recommending that you contact them or that you contact the department secretary. And alternatively, you may have other GAs or TAs that are working on that same course. And there may be a lead GA or TA that you can contact in cases of an emergency. And another broad question that you can ask is how many hours you're expected to work per week, as well as um, if they would like you to track or log your hours. And so related to that first part about hours per week, you may have some weeks that are really um, intensive and have a lot of your hours allocated to those specific weeks. And you may have some weeks that you're hardly doing anything. So getting a sense of when uh, those weeks, those heavier weeks will be, will help you to schedule your semester. And lastly, you should ask about whether and where you are expected to hold office hours. And we'll go into a bit more detail regarding that um, in a few minutes. And now on to questions about policies. So you should be clear about what kind of guidance you're allowed to offer the students during office hours. Some instructors are particular about what information should be shared and how much guidance can be offered. And so getting a sense of what they would like you to do will help you be clear on regarding the, that specific class's policies for guidance. And you can also ask the instructor whether there are certain course or university policies that you particularly need to be aware of for that course. And it's really important to ask your instructor how they would like you to handle any difficult situations that you may encounter. For example, if you see a case of academic dishonesty or if a student is challenging you, maybe about a mark that they received, getting a sense of how they would like you to handle that will help you then feel more comfortable when those situations arise, if they do arise as well as asking questions about policies regarding assignment extensions and accommodations or things like makeup tests and assignments. And this will also include questions about accessibility accommodations. So now I'll hand it over to Kayla. Thanks Katie for all of that great information. So we're going to keep rolling with the different questions um, that you may ask your professor at the start of the semester, or these may come out throughout the semester as you're um, fulfilling your responsibilities. So one really important area of questions is um, questions about communication. And here are some examples um, that you may want to ask. So a great starter topic is to get an understanding of how often you and the instructor are expected to communicate as well as your method you should communicate by. So they may like regular updates or they may just wanna hear from you on a case by case basis um, with updates specific to certain students. Or you may have an instructor who does not expect much communication at all and that's totally okay as well. So it's just important that you understand kind of the standards at the start of the semester and then just follow through with them as the semester unfolds. 
You can also ask about communication with other GAs or TAs if you have um, multiple individuals from one class and get an understanding of whether you all will be meeting throughout the course to provide updates or how things are going. And these types of questions are more related to communication with the instructor. And in the next couple slides, we're gonna provide some examples of questions that cover topics related to communicating with students specifically. So questions for communicating with students include things like how they um, expect you to contact, like how you're expected to contact or communicate with them. So should you contact them by email? And maybe this should only be done during class time or only during your office hours. So this is likely something that's going to vary depending on the class that you're a GA or TA for. And especially for online classes, you may have a discussion board or some other platform that students can ask questions outside of class on. Um, so just ask the instructor if there will be one for your course and if you're the one who's responsible for monitoring this and keeping track of student responses or answering any concerns they may have. Additionally, you want to get an understanding of expectations regarding how quickly you need to respond to students. So some instructors have very specific rules, such as a 24-hour rule or never respond after business hours. Um, so they'll all be very different. Um, and this can be specific for when assignments are submitted as well. Instructors may have a guideline where if it's within 24 hours and the assignment needs to be submitted, you're not allowed to answer any assignment related questions. And you should also ask the instructor um, if you should tell them about student emails and if they'd like to be included on all student emails. So for example, for every interaction or encounter you have with a student, do they want to be CC'd on all those emails? Or what are, what are the standards that they want to abide by? So before we continue on to just um, provide examples of other questions in different areas or different topics, um, Katie's pulled up a whiteboard and essentially we just want to know if you can think of any other questions that you may think are important to ask about the topics we just discussed. So we talked about roles and expectations, talked about policies, and we talked about the importance of communication. So just to brainstorm for yourself, um, and to help other GAs and TAs in this workshop. If you can just post any other questions you can think of that are important to ask regarding the topics we just discussed. All right, perfect. There, we have a suggestion. Should we answer student questions ourselves or wait for a cue? Or what do I do as the lead GA? That's a great question. So it's also important to ask the instructor, okay, who is the lead GA? Am I the lead GA? Um, what are the differences and responsibilities between us? Um, clarification on assignments. Yep, it's important to ask the instructors um, how much detail you can provide students when trying to help them with assignments to make sure you're not giving away any answers. Yep, these are great suggestions. We have a couple more seconds if anyone else has anything they want to add. What if a student doesn't use their UNs or email? That that is a great that's a great question to ask um, the prof about how they want you to deal with that. And hopefully the professor at the beginning of the semester or the instructor at the beginning of the semester makes it clear that. Okay, correspondence should be only through UNs or emails. Um, but if that situation does arise, that's definitely something that you want to know how to respond to. Are there any other resources I should be familiar with? Yep, that's awesome too. Um, there may be resources very specific to a certain course that you need to be aware of, certain textbooks, um, different online programs. You never know, so it would be great to ask that question up front as well. I am a GA in sculpture. Do I have to help students with their work or let them do everything? Yes, so it's important to establish those boundaries of how much you can help. For sure. Awesome. So those are a lot of great questions that you can also just kind of think to ask. Um, 
before the semester gets started or before you start responsibility. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Still kind of going over a list of questions that you may want to ask the instructor. But we're going to focus on all questions related to grading specifically. So the, the what, the when, the how, and the where of grading, chances are this is going to be a large chunk of your hours or a big responsibility you're going to have as a GA or TA. So it's important that you start to think about all the details that you might want to establish um, with the instructor. So you might want to consider asking, what assignments am I responsible for marking? So will you mark all forms of assignments or only certain types? Additionally, do you mark all of one assignment or will the work be divided? So if you have multiple GAs and TAs in the course, um, is the work divided evenly? Or if there's um, weekly labs or assignments, do you mark one week and then you have a week off? So there is a lot of variation in this area. So just make sure that you're aware of whatever it is um, for the specific course you're assigned to. And it's important to ask when students are expected to submit assignments and when you're expected to have feedback and marking completed. So you wanna know when students are expected submit, to submit um, so you can kind of um, provide them with the appropriate due dates if they reach out to you with questions. And it's good for you to know when you have to have feedback and marking completed by, because then you can schedule it into your own um, planner and be organized in regards to also staying on top of your own classwork as well. For the how, there are an array of questions that may be asked. It's important to understand the marking criteria. So will a rubric be provided to you? And is this information also provided to the students? And where can they find this information? Before you start marking, you can ask the professor if you will practice marking um, a specific assignment with them to ensure that you know how to mark it appropriately and provide adequate feedback before you're sent off to mark a bunch of assignments. Um, I've personally found this really helpful as a GA, always going through a few um, through que a few questions or a few papers um, with the instructor, getting their feedback on how I'm marking before I mark a bunch, and then I'm just more confident while I'm marking as well. And some assessments may just be created in Blackboard, so they may be automatically marked, so such as a multiple choice quiz. So also make this distinction with the instructor as well. Um, so you're aware of as assessments that are automatically marked and that you may not have to mark fully. And it's important to understand the procedures for if a student has concerns about your marking or the grade they received, um, which Katie already touched on. But this is definitely something that can be emphasized because you want to know how you should or what the protocols are to react to these um, kind of unpredictable situations. And finally, the where is another important aspect in relation to grading. So where do students submit their assignments so that you can access them and then be able to mark them? And then also on the flip side, where do you enter grades? So once you're done marking something, where do you actually put the grades? So do you need to enter them in the Blackboard Grade Center? Or do you also need to keep them recorded in a separate Excel document for the instructor? Sometimes instructors like to have um, an offline version of the grades. Um, so just be aware of the preferences for the instructor you're assigned to. And also, if you're uploading marks to Blackboard, understand when the instructor wants the grades to be visible to students. So they probably don't want them visible as you're going through marking the assignments. They probably really want them released all at once so that all students receive the, their marks or grades at the same time. And there may be instances too where the instructor will need some time to review the grades before you formally um, make them visible to the students. So just be aware of all these little distinctions as well um, that the and preferences that the instructor may have. I just see some uh, something posted in the chat, so I'll just check on that. Oh, it's just a previous notification. Okay, so before we continue on. Switch topics again to wrap.
on that side, Heidi just pulled up another whiteboard. So similar to the um, previous whiteboard we did, um, we want to know if you can think of any other questions related to grading that you think may be important to ask um, the instructor of, for your appointmentship. Um, and once again, we're trying to just stay focused on questions related to grading um, since, is the, since this is the topic we just discussed. What if students are consistently missing a component of the answer? That's a really good, that's a great question. Um, so that, that's kind of related to when you're marking, you may come up with um, specific questions. Um, so in some instances, maybe the marking key actually needs to be changed because the question wasn't as clear as you may have thought for the students. Um, so even when you're marking, like in the process of marking, and you think you've prepared to be able to mark appropriately, you never know what's going to come up as you start marking like 50 exams or something. So just definitely keep the instructor in the loop and ask them um, how you want to accommodate situations like that or even part marks as well. So that's definitely that's definitely a great point to bring up. How do you deal with students that write as much as they can to try to get all the marks? Oh, that's another awesome question. That's definitely something that'll come up to you if you're marking longer um, long answer questions or something like that. Um, so, yep, ask the instructor how they want you to deal with that. Yep, do I get partial marks? Yep, those are three great questions related to grading um, that are definitely important to consider. Do I need to learn APA? Yeah, so if you're, in a, if you're assigned to a course that has a lot of paper writing, um, you may have to become familiar with their certain formatting criteria um, specific to those assignments. So that's great to ask up front as well. Yeah, those are th those are some great questions um, that are definitely very important to consider about grading. So thank you for your participation. Okay, we're just gonna jump back into the PowerPoint now. So in this ever-changing virtual environment, questions about technology seem to be more relevant than ever. Um, so it's important to understand how to operate the course site, such as Blackboard, and you may need to upload course content or put closed captions on pre-recorded videos. So just be aware of how to do all these little nuances as well. And especially for hybrid courses, make sure you understand if and where you're holding office hours. So if they are virtual, and if so, what platform should you be using? So should you be using Blackboard or Microsoft Teams? And how often should you plan to meet with students? And a great resource to help you with any issues related to technology may actually be your fellow GAs or TAs who are assigned to the same course um, you're assigned to. Um, so you can troubleshoot and figure things out together, or may they ever may have previously had the problem you're experiencing, and they can provide you with some advice or troubleshooting that they've had to do. So then just right at the start of the semester, I think it's really important that you ask the instructor for the contact information for other GAs and TAs. So we're gonna pull up a whiteboard again um, and see if you can add any other questions related to technology. So what other questions do you have about technology? or should you have about technology to ask? Where can I go to learn more about Blackboard? That's a great question. Um, and we're actually going to provide some resources and a little detail about that in some subsequent slides um, to hopefully answer some of that information for you. Should I give students my phone number? Uh, right off the bat, I would, I would say no. I know from previous experience, um, to keep it professional, you should only be corresponding um, by you wins or email. And the other thing is you have to think, do I want students to have my phone number and then be able to 
kind of invade your privacy or get a hold of you at any time of the day. Um, but that it, that's a great that's a great um, question to bring up because we're kind of in a weird situation right now where we're working from home and working virtually. So it may not be as easy for students to track you down in person if you're not on campus as much. So that brings up some great, great conversation. And are you planning to share your screen often or use the camera only? How do I monitor the chat, use polls? Yeah, so these are all questions you should ask. Um, and some of these topics as well, um, you can take workshops like you are today to become familiar with the different platforms. So if you were to ask your professor right off the bat, are you using Blackboard? Then reach out and use some of these resources or workshops to learn all of the details um, related to the different platforms. Are you going to use other tools and teams in Blackboard? Absolutely, that's important to ask. Do I have to learn about teams? Yeah, these are great questions. Can students still access free U of W copies of Microsoft Office? And how do they access them to complete their Word and PowerPoint? Yeah, that's a great point as well. Um, I think that's something we take for granted and often I'm not even sure if all students realize that they have access to that. So that brings up a great point. Um, maybe it's something that's even something the instructor can address like right away at the start of the semester and provide them with that information. Um, yeah, for sure, that's a great question. So now moving away from brainstorming specific questions and just um, basically some just general suggestions again. So this may not apply to everything, everyone because you may not um, have other GAs or TAs for your course as you may be the only one. But as noted previously, if you do have other GAs and TAs, then try to connect with one another um, and kind of build a community. So this can provide you with the opportunity to mark together online um, and, and bounce ideas off of each other. And another great resource is not only the GAs or TAs that you're currently working with, or other GAs and TAs that you know have previously been assigned to the course you're working with. So um, in this way, you may be able to ask them for additional tips and strategies for being a GA or TA for the specific course um, in your department um, before the start of the semester as well. And being a GA or TA, it's, it's a job. You're getting paid to do so. You're on a contract. So make sure that you really take responsibility and take ownership. So own your duties and responsibility. So ask all the questions we've talked about today up front. Know the syllabus in detail so you're well informed and you can execute your duties um, as best as you can. Um, and then at the same time, if part of your role is to interact with the students, then make sure that they can get a hold of you and know your contact information and know your office hours so that you're available to them as well. And then something that will help you really do your best um, job at being a GA or TA and also help you just keep on top of your own um, research or your own coursework it's to just be organized, be organized right off the bat. So it's really helpful if you have a planner where you can keep track of your to-do list um, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis and schedule in all the important dates. So when are assignments due? When do you need to submit marks by? Um, right up front, try to figure out when the busy points are in the semester so you can plan well in advance. Um, and this way you can hopefully accommodate your own um, school coursework or research schedule around the busy points for your GA and TA responsibilities. I know sometimes in grad school, we have the opportunity to pick our presentation dates. So if you can kind of accommodate when you're going to be busy marking um, with your own due dates, um, that can definitely make the semester go a lot smoother as well. And you're already taking um, the right, a good step in the right direction in this regard to develop your GAs and, and TA skills since you're here today. Um, so just continue to take advantage of resources like this. Attend other, other um, workshops that are more specific 
So maybe a workshop related to Blackboard specifically, because you know that the instructor is going to expect you to be able to operate Blackboard in detail. And just keep in mind that, yes, you're doing using some of these resources at the start of the semester, but really you can use them throughout the semester as well at any point where if you're having trouble in any area of your responsibilities. And then an, an area very relevant to our current learning environment is the topic of online concerns. Um, so maybe you haven't been a GA or TA online yet, or perhaps you have, but we just want to kind of shed some light on some other areas that you might want to be aware of if you're going to be doing a lot of your um, responsibilities online. So for example, if you're struggling with a poor internet connection, which I personally experienced a lot living in the county, what steps can you take to help prevent this? Well, it's important to determine where in your house is the best connection found, and in some instances, an Ethernet cord may be very beneficial. And then for other um, situations, you may actually need to just turn off your video and your audio um, for the attendees because there may not they, there may be too many. So I know for this workshop today, we have the video your video turned off and your audio um, just so that everything can run smoother. So instead, we've asked that you post in the chat or we're working with you through whiteboards. Um, so if you have larger groups, you may have to make accommodations like that. And if you're holding a live session, you probably want to have a backup plan. So if your internet fails or you can't get onto Microsoft Teams or Blackboard, um, have a different way to share the content. So maybe you have a version shared or a pre-recorded version on your computer and you can email it to the attendees or something like that. And if the problem's not specific to your internet, there are sources to learn and receive help for Blackboard and Microsoft Teams, and we'll provide you with more of these details in a few slides. And for some classes, you may actually have some responsibility to teach some content. So if so, then maybe consider the following. So it's helpful if you can include practice problems before students come to lecture. So things such as think, pair, share activities um, and be familiar with using breakout rooms because these are really beneficial because you can send students away with a question or a case study in small groups and then they can come back and discuss it as a big group. And if you're asking questions to the students and they don't provide the correct answer, just take a minute to pause and maybe re-explain the concept because um, there might be some confusion. And we've already um, talked about this sporadically throughout this workshop, but uh, undoubtedly you will get asked questions by the students. Um, and if students request to meet outside of office hours, consider that they may have a conflict with another class. And in this case, you may be able to just resolve their questions by email, or you may have to meet with them online at a different time. So even if you meet with students outside of your normal office hours, it is important though that you continue to record these hours because these hours do count towards your number of contracted hours. And once again, it's just important that you discuss with the instructor how they want you to handle meeting with students outside of predetermined office hours. Um, so this may be a situation that arises. Um, so just try to get an understanding of how the instructor wants you to deal with it. And on the same topic, when meeting with students, some questions may be more easily addressed live by using video chat. And if this is the case, then once again, it's important that you understand the different functions of the platforms you may be responsible to use and meet um, students on and how to use these platforms from both um, meeting with students individually or in a group setting when appropriate. And on that note, we're going to provide you with some resources um, to further expand your information regarding where you can get help for Blackboard or where you can get help for Microsoft Teams, or if you're teaching, where are some sources where you can further enhance your teaching skills. Um, and some of these, the first few resources you probably are already familiar with because you've probably already received um, your contracts and such, but just so you have them for your reference, 
the first link that will appear in the chat is information regarding the logistics of being a GA or TA, so the application form, notice of appointment to assistantship, and form one. And then we're just going to pop a link in there. So if you're interested in knowing your specific payroll dates, here's a link for that. And before I move on with more resources, um, was, were there any other questions that anyone had on sort of these last topics that we just um, wrapped up? I'll wait a couple seconds to see if anything pops up in the chat. If not, I'll just, we'll just keep rolling with the different resources. Okay, we seem to be good. But if you think of anything, once again, just pop in the chat or just wait till the end of this section and we'll wrap up with some questions too. So to learn more about the collective agreement as a GRTA, here's a link to that. Um, you're probably already familiar with this because you're here today, but to access more um, opportunities to further develop your skills, here's the main website for the GATA network to be able to find all of their resources and other workshops. And if you're a new student employee of the university, or if it's been more than one year since you've had a contract with the U, then here's a link for new hire forms. And this link was um, shared previously, but before being hired, there's training you'll need to complete. So you can follow this link to receive more information about that. If you ever need to contact graduate studies, here's um, that information. And here's a link to a similar presentation that may help you further expand your knowledge on the topics we discussed today. And if you're looking to learn how to engage students, especially if you have to lead labs or even specific lectures or discussion groups, um, then here's some resources that may be beneficial to you. And a good source to further enhance your skills, especially teaching related, are courses offered by the Center for Teaching and Learning. And here's a link to their registration page. Once again, this is likely a page you're already familiar with, um, but here's the, the, the link for registration for the GATA Academy. And then specific to learning more about Blackboard and how to operate it, here's a helpful page um, that you can use to understand all the different functions. And then a really good resource to get kind of instant help on Blackboard is to join um, this Blackboard Cafe. So it's a virtual help desk and during their hours, you can basically drop in at any time and you likely only have to wait a couple of minutes and you can meet with someone live and they can walk you through whatever issues you're having and, and they, you can share your screen with them, um, which is really beneficial as well. And then if you're having IT or technical issues that aren't Blackboard specific, um, then submit an IT, IT ticket um, and you can receive help that way with some of your um, issues related to technology. And that's all the information we have for you today. Um, thanks for coming to today's workshop. We, Katie and I hope that we provided you with some good information as the semester gets off the ground. And hopefully now you're thinking about what you need to ask the instructor before you start or what you need to get organized beforehand. Um, and I just see that page posted in the chat as well, just asking you to Please fill out the feedback form before you leave today's workshop as well. Helps us improve the workshop um, um, for you next time. Um, so yes, thank you for attending today and hope you have a good weekend.